Okay, well, we might, uh, might get started here. <clears throat> so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, SETICON 2. Uh, we are uh, very lucky to be joined. My name is Adrian Brown, and I'm going to be your host uh, uh, for uh, the next half hour. We're very lucky to be joined by Jonathan Fay. Uh, Jonathan's a uh, software developer of Microsoft Research and a passionate amateur astronomer who's uh, built his own telescope. Uh, you know, observatory, excuse me, and uh, I'm sure you'll give us the uh, the uh, address that we can get to your uh, uh, astronomy building photos and so on that you sent me. Sure, I have to plug that in just a second. Uh, so, Jonathan develops software for astronomy, imaging, and visualization for the Microsoft Worldwide Telescope, uh, or WWT, which is now has a user base of uh, seven million people, and. Um, Hopefully, we're going to uh, hear about that during uh, during our talk. But um, firstly, uh, I, uh, Jonathan, I wanted to um, to ask you where your passion for astronomy came from in the first place, and, and uh, even before you started working for Microsoft, what what led you into looking up at the stars? Uh, when I was a a kid, I don't remember exactly how old I was, but probably around ten or. 10 or 11 or something like that. My aunt brought me, bought me a, um, what would I now consider junk, a department store telescope. Uh, and it was one of these, uh, I think about a two and a half inch refractor with a cardboard tube and uh, you know, 2000 power or something like that, which of course is ridiculous uh, with you know, diffraction limited optics would never let it even approach a you know, hundred power, much less uh, that, but, but still, it inspired me to look up and look at the stars. And um, I, I think, uh, uh, too, one of the things that Im impacted me was um, I would, uh, uh, we would often go to the High Sierras, and we had the station wagon, and my brother and I would sit in the back of the station wagon in the tilt of the window, uh, driving down US 395 up to uh, um, the High Sierras, we would just see these unbelievably gorgeous star-filled nights on these dark roads driving at night. And I would tell him stories about, you know, uh, the Mars monster and, you know, these, these different uh, things relating to, you know, my fantasy of what the stars were like and what things were like in, in outer space. And um, the, uh, I, my, my brother once told me about how he had thought it was so cool that his big brother had, had done this for him. Uh, he ended up in the Hollywood special effects industry um, you know, telling stories about space monsters too. So, um, but um, that 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 sort of uh, got me started because uh, someone was willing to spend the time to get that spark started for me. Right. And so, uh, you, during your time at high school, um, did you get much exposure to uh, astronomy through uh, high school, or what were, were there educational <laughs> opportunities that you took advantage of? What so I think that, uh, that the, other, the other spark that happened was being interested. My, my parents kind of wondered if there's anything that I'd ever get interested in because I seemed to be kind of like wandering around directionless. Um, and then finally, I, I found some electrical wire hanging from a tree and started hooking up with batteries and a, a flashlight and stuff. And then eventually started wanting anything electronic and taking it apart. And they knew maybe I might have a future when I could actually put it back together again. Right, yes. um, but uh, so there was the, the electronics. And then uh, eventually um, in high school, um, my mom took us to see a Disney double feature that included the black hole and then some princess movie. And um, I saw the black hole and then ditched the second part of the feature and went over to a Radio Shack and got on a TRS-80 computer in the lobby and started working on programming it. And that eventually led to me taking my lawnmower money and buying a computer. And one of the first things I did was, was start to figure out what mathematics to simulate orbits and astronomy and, and uh, visualizing that sort of thing. So even with uh, very crude 128 by 48 black and white monochrome graphics, uh, I started uh, playing with that. And did, uh, where did that, programming lead you to, and um, uh, where, uh, uh, <coughs> where, what, did we see any uh, 
evidence of that uh, program now in your work uh, at Microsoft and um, well, I, how I, did you get from there to, uh, to your job at Microsoft? So I, I, over time, uh, my interest in computer graphics and uh, mathematics uh, kind of always sat in the background. I also uh, became interested in, in chemistry and uh, uh, that was, uh, um, I decided to pursue chemistry and computer science. Uh, together and so when I look at um, I also uh, became a ham radio buff and so radio astronomy was very interesting to me and uh, so uh, from the radio side I, I enjoyed uh, optical astronomy but I really wanted to do radio work you know moon bounce and things like that mm -hmm. but really within a city it's very hard to do any amateur radio astronomy um, you know with the in the radio noise uh, but um, uh, over time, um, I, I kept playing with computer graphics, uh, playing with simulation, working with uh, you know, the ne each successive generation of graphics card and, and computing power that I would get, I would already know how to, you know, already have a way to use it all because it, the, the vision of, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it was scarcely, you know, PC XT days in like the mi mid late 80s that I was already trying to figure out how I could simulate an entire planet uh, and be able to fly into it. And we, we were still 20 years off from that technology, right. uh, but I tried nonetheless, and, and we were able to sort of uh, fake, uh, I was able to fake things for a while. Um, but so the computer graphics stayed. Um, what sort of software were you using to put that together? Uh, early on, it was just my own uh, software. I had to learn how to uh, do trigonometry and uh, to do the 3D math and stuff as in high school. Um, and as I went into uh, uh, college, I took computer science courses, but they really didn't teach a lot about that, so I sort of would have to self-investigate this. Uh, then eventually, um, we started using like 3D Studio, uh, and then uh, uh, finally a Lightwave 3D. Um, and there became a juncture in, in my life where I actually had an op uh, offer to work for a Hollywood special effects studio and Microsoft, and uh, my wife uh, was newly married, and my wife wanted to raise kids in Seattle, not L.A., mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, uh, we took the trip up to work with Microsoft, and uh, I, I thought that that would pretty much close a lot of the doors to that, but in actuality, over time, it opened the doors. I got to work with a lot of uh, uh, you know, graphics pioneers like Alvy Ray Smith, who was a co one of the co-founders of Pixar, and uh, Jim Blinn and and uh, Jim Kajia and some of these people who, you know, Jim Blinn had done the uh, like Voyager flyby videos and a lot of this uh, astro visualization. Um, and as time ca uh, came by, um, went by, I was able to work with uh, uh, Jim Gray, who um, uh, worked on a project called Terra Server. And it, it, we ended up sort of crossing tracks with him and Tom Barkley. Um, and that, this was the, like the first generation of uh, satellite, you know, seeing the Earth from space and being able to zoom in and see your, your house on the Internet, right? Mm -hmm. And that sort of spawned all these other mapping programs and, you know, the Google Earth and Bing Maps of the, of the world. Um, and so he, his, uh, as starting to follow what he was doing, he switched from the visualizing Earth to astronomy. And then um, I st as I started getting involved in both the visualizing um, the, in using 3D, immersive technologies like, in like 3D that was coming up for gaming, to start using uh, that to visualize uh, the Earth. And um, then I turned that to, to look at Mars and the Moon and uh, the other t planetary missions and then uh, turned it to say, I wanted to look at the sky. And, and this is where things started falling apart a little bit because astronomy really didn't uh, have, you know, all sky mosaics and uh, multi-resolution data. Uh, things were all stored as these FITS files, uh, you know, in high dynamic range, sort of the worst possible way that you could deliver imagery mm -hmm. uh, in order to make it fast and fluid. Um, and so at that point, I started working with uh, folks who were, were in astronomy and had the vision of that to try to uh, create an all-sky seamless stitch so that we could make a browser for the sky. 
Um, and that, uh, over time, exploded into uh, multi-wavelengths and um, uh, then a 3D universe browser. And uh, then uh, uh, Curtis Wong, who was my uh, uh, boss at uh, Microsoft Research, had always had wanted to build a, an astronomy storytelling engine. And so when we got together on this, along with Jim Gray, um, it, it just seemed like this was this, this cool vehicle of taking this 3D technology and the storytelling engine we wanted to build. And uh, then Jim, unfortunately, disappeared in a, in a boating accident, we, we assume. He uh, went out to, to sea and never came back. Um, and we, at that point, it sort of shook everything uh, uh, for us, and we decided that we wanted to do something in his legacy. So we took the name of the paper that he had written with Alex Sisley about the Worldwide Telescope and uh, named the product for that and dedicated it to him and decided we would make this tool that would let astronomy researchers do research with it but make it freely available to the public and create a storytelling engine that could be used by educators and by researchers to discuss what they knew about the universe and inspire uh, everybody in any generation, like they say, from K to gray. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm interested in um, how, uh, how your research was viewed within Microsoft. And I, I think of Microsoft as a, you know, as, uh, an operating system company that you know, has, has, has branched out into gaming and, and all sorts of stuff now, but how, does your project get involved, get funded inside of Microsoft, and and, uh, and and what can you give us a little bit of the inside nature into into how you fit into the Microsoft world? So um, Microsoft Research is a sort of an interesting uh, organization since we're one of the uh, larger companies on Earth. We can af afford to do a lot of things that uh, smaller companies can't invest in at at that you know at that scale. And one of the things that we decided uh, in long ago in Microsoft's history, I wasn't part of that decision, but was decided by uh, higher ups at Microsoft, is that research was something that was that with a company as big as they were growing, fundamental research was very important um, in order to uh, continue uh, to be able to uh, be um, uh, respond to opportunities, to be able to push the state of the art. So, for instance. Uh, you know, more than half of the SIGGRAPH papers are, are written by, or a good portion of them, are written by Microsoft researchers. I mean, a, a very large uh, a chunk of it. Uh, there's a lot. So you guys are encouraged to, to exactly. publish your work. Exactly. So it's so encouraged to publish. Um, and one of the things that's often happened, like in the case of TerraServer, is sometimes the only way you can really do the research properly is to build an application and see how people will use it. Mm -hmm. And so the artifact of that oftentimes just gets given away, put on the internet or something, and it, and, you know, it sits in ages and, and maybe that's never gets touched again. With this, uh, we sparked an interest in people, and there was a huge explosion of, of everyone who saw this, even though we had no advertising money. Everybody who saw this loved it. They told their friends, they told their, uh, their friends' friends, and this thing just exploded. And, and when we say worldwide, at first we were kind of guilty we were English only. And uh, now we're like localized, you know, in Russian and Chinese and Indic languages and, and uh, communities are coming together to actually translate it uh, to uh, bring it to their own countries. Okay. So um, maybe if, uh, it would be good to get an idea at this stage of the capabilities of the telescope and maybe you can, you can tell us about what people can get out of your software now and, 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 and also what the, we'll get to what the plans are in the future. But, but. What are the so, capabilities now? So, so uh, part of this is that this, none of this would have been possible without the, the deep partnerships that we've had. Uh, so Microsoft Research has worked a lot with, with uh, you know, NASA, with uh, you know, uh, uh, Caltech and JPL and Harvard and Adler Planetarium with Morrison, uh, you know, uh, Oxford, uh, Cambridge, you know, uh, lots of organizations, lots of uh, people who have uh, taken their mission and EPO goals and worked with us to, to help partner in that. And so this is a collection of, of uh, all that work to come together in an intersection of, of, of this concept that Jim had about the democratization of science. Um, and 
and the, uh, so a lot of that capability has grown because the community has said, um, like for instance, when we first launched, um, we only had a sky view to be able to see the sky as from Earth, mm -hmm. and we had a planetary surface view and panoramas. Uh, but people were asking, I want to be able to see the 3D solar system. I want to be able to fly to Mars from Earth. Uh, one scientist uh, from uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey said, I want to see the large scale structure of the universe. And I'm like, are you insane? This is just like a 2D sky. And you're trying to tell me we're going to put millions of galaxies and fly out to them. And, and, uh, but by partnering with like Sloan and Galaxy Zoo and Adler Planetarium, we brought the 3D large scale structure of the universe so people can fly out and see what it's like beyond our Milky Way. Um, we've, uh, can you we've give us some idea of how, how, how does that get done inside the computer, inside <laughs> the program? Because you're so, immediately th thinking, well, that's just way too much data. What, how do you handle the complexity of that data? Uh, so uh, I, will, I will state it in like um, Castle Wolfenstein, Doom. Mm -hmm. um, Halo, these are the, the reasons why we can do what we do today with, with computer graphics in, in this environment. Because what's happened is, is people addicted to these games want more and more and more. And they've created an economy of scale where you can put a supercomputer into a chip that fits on a video card that you can sell for a few hundred dollars that will do teraflops of data um, and that has enabled, uh, like AMD has a new processor for $79, it's one teraflop, 400 cores, plus four or two or four uh, CPU cores. And now you can actually calculate the orbits of everything we know about in the solar system in real time with that sort of computing. And without gaming, that wouldn't have been possible. On the flip side, though, is that kids now they see so much gaming and graphics that unless you engage them with something that compelling and that cool, they're not going to be putting it on their radar. So we have to actually make an environment that makes them go, wow, space is cool, right? Because when you look at, uh, when you look at the state of video games and movies and everything like that, it's hard to compete with that. And so we had to create something. So we're using the technology. We're using fire to fight fire. We're using this gaming technology to be able to simulate the universe in a scientifically faithful way, but that still makes a very compelling case. And now you can run that uh, on a, you know, a desktop PC, and you can run it in some of the largest planetariums in the world. I, uh, I saw this running, a Worldwide Telescope running in Adler Planetarium. They have 20 projectors that are like a 4K each, for like 80 megapixels or something like that. Ab you know, unbelievable. That's, so that's basically the power to run 20 different theaters, digital movie theaters, and it's being put on the dome to be able to explore space, and that's just incredible. Right. And I can imagine that the scaling, I mean, you, obviously you don't know the destination for, for uh, the platform when you're writing the code, so the scaling has to be pretty spot on. How do you, uh, how do you get the machine to scale to these faster and faster computers. So luckily, uh, luckily Moore's law is coming along and things are increasing at a pretty steady rate. Um, we're also finding that the, the missions, like working in the future with the Gaia mission, they're going to be bringing us, uh, right now the, the stars that we have, 3D stars and Worldwide Telescope are pretty paltry. There's 135,000 stars from Hipparcos catalog that we have good 3D distance for. Gaia is going to bring us a billion. <laughs> Ouch, yes. And so I'm looking, I'm scratching my head right now, and I'm like, good thing it's not even launched yet, because we're going to need a few cycles of Morse law before uh. we'll be able to do that <laughs> in real time. And they're going to have proper motion for this. You're going to be able to actually simulate the movement of the Milky Way over time. Mm. You know, that's, that's going to be mind-blowing uh, to see what we're going to be able to do with that. But on the same time, you know, I look at it and I say, well, you know, we're going to get all this great power, but I'm already kind of like, I want to do stuff now that requires way more power than, than, than we already have. So there's, there's uh, you know, two, two sides to that. Where So talking about um, power to the, uh, the Connect interface, can you tell us how uh, you got involved with the Connect interface onto 
Worldwide Telescope and produced a very popular YouTube video for it. Uh, so Kinect uh, is a, a uh, accessory for the Xbox 360 that's also um, available for, as, a, as a Windows plugin. And what it does is it, it uh, draws a, a pattern of infrared dots over the scene. And it uses the same sort of stereo vision that humans have. It actually, from, uh, uh, it would be like if your eye broadcasted a set of points out of one eye and then saw it from the other, and that's how you saw in stereo. So it gives you essentially depth to every single pixel. And this significantly improves our ability to do computer vision and interpret what people are doing. We can interpret where people's hands are, where their skeleton is, and allows you to track them and actually take very fine gestural movement and turn it into computer input. Um, when this so even before Kinect came out for the Xbox, or was even publicly announced, or even announced internally w within Microsoft, um, Andy Wilson, uh, um, who is uh, one of the guys who invented multi-touch computing and a lot of the you know, kind of co you know, uh, concepts that you see in, in uh, you know, touch walls and, and things like that, um, he, was work he wanted to work with uh, a, a full dome immersive environment and being able to use just your hands, uh, instead of touching a wall, being able to make gestures in free space. And so we actually experimented with, with a fisheye lens and being able to actually um, do a multi-touch gesture. So what you would do is you would pinch your fingers like this, and that would be a contact point. So you could come up like this, and you would pinch, and you would move your hands, and that would be like a multi-touch gesture on an iPad or something like that. Um, uh, so we did that like three years or two or three years before Connect came out. Mm -hmm. And so we had already thought about how Worldwide Telescope could be enabled with that. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and then suddenly Connect comes out and it becomes easy to make this. With no, you, know, you didn't have to have $50,000 worth of hardware now to detect people's things. You could do this for a $150 uh, piece. And so we saw, I saw this and um, one Sunday morning I woke up and said, you know, um, this would be cool to make this happen. And so I basically worked on it in all my free time. Uh, my family actually hardly noticed that I was ignoring them because I you know, to, went out to breakfast and we did, did some things and everything. Uh, we actually you know, worked, and so, but, but every time I'd get back home, I'd like slide into my office and work on this. And about one in the morning, I, I t told my wife, step in front of the TV and do this. And she does that, and she goes, wow, you know, the sky is like zooming in. And uh, I, when I saw this, I said, oh, this is going to be so cool. Uh, and uh, so I played it with it with my kids, and then we brought this in, and immediately they were like, no, you can't show this to anyone. And I go, what? <laughs> and uh, they said, well, this Shh, is kids. too cool, mm -hmm. and it will steal attention away from, you know, other, other efforts and stuff. And so eventually they just determined that they would make us a, a software development kit to let other people do this mm -hmm. so that other researchers could work with, with it and not just people who kind of knew the guts of, of, uh, oh. of That's okay. <laughs> well, um, I, uh, I want to make sure that we uh, give the audience members a chance to ask any questions too that uh, we may have. Do we have any uh, questions at all out there? We did mention at the start of the, uh, your planetarium has a uh, website. Do you want to give us that web address? So it's, um, I feel kind of bad because it's been like eight years since I've updated the website. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I, one of the, uh, during the um, uh, a time that I was doing a lot with astrophotography I, in Seattle, you don't want to set up a telescope uh, only to have the rain come in or clouds come in. And when you have a 150-pound telescope and all this astronomy gear, uh, it, it really, if you wanted to observe in Seattle, you had to have an observatory. So people say, why would you put an observatory in Seattle? Well, if you're going to observe in Seattle, you've got to have one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but at that point, I, I, I thought it would be very cool to basically learn everything it took to make it happen. So we actually designed... I designed the 3D model for it. Um, uh, 
uh, and built a dome, a dome from scratch with the old style split shutter design that looked like Mount Wilson. And um, I, my kids and I basically spent weekends and evenings in the garage, you know, uh, cutting things out of plywood and, and uh, putting this together. And eventually we had our own fully automated observatory. It opens and shuts and rotates automatically and we can uh, run it from a smartphone. Um, but that, we had that running about like, I think it's about eight years ago now, or a little bit longer, um, from, from the early smartphones. And you know, now, of course, everything can be done with an app. But, mm -hmm. um, but that, I think that was a great education because uh, it helped me really kind of dive into the, the whole aspects of running an observatory and how to deal with it and how to deal with all the data. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of really helped prepare me for what we did with the Worldwide Telescope. So what's, what does the future hold for the Worldwide Telescope? What, can you give, any, give us any teases about uh, uh, how the project's uh, going to proceed from here? So one of the things we wanted to do is uh, make it available everywhere. So we're planning to figure out how you can basically get Worldwide Telescope from a, uh, a phone all the way to the planetarium, mm -hmm. right? So that w you can run it on any sort of device um, we're going to be dealing with even bigger data using even more compute power. Um, one of the things we're finally, we're, we're having to struggle with is uh, some of the new things we're doing with simulation and using the compute power to actually uh, drive uh, you know, simulations of galaxy collisions and, and uh, globular clusters and things like that are going to require us to use uh, some, a new thing called direct compute, which isn't compatible with uh, Windows XP. But there's so many XP machines <laughs> mm -hmm. in, the, in the classroom nowadays. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things is uh, I, it sometimes holds us back to have to keep compatibility back with you know, 10, 12-year-old machines and still have it run in the classroom. So uh, those are the challenges, but we're, we're eventually going to make the break to uh, uh, to be able to bring that, and then being able to do simulations right there in, in real time is, is going to be uh, pretty amazing. Do you ever get to go into the classroom and uh, give demonstrations to students? How does, how does that work? Um, uh, I've actually, um, uh, one, one day my daughter uh, uh, asked me, Dad, uh, can you come over after school because my teacher has a computer problem he'd like you to work on. <laughs> and um, I, I just thought it was, you know, my, I work for Microsoft, you know, you know, some stuff. And by complete random coincidence, the problem he had was they had a password on their proxy, and he was trying to install this program that he was used at home so he could teach the kids with it, and it was Worldwide Telescope. Mm -hmm. And so I set it up and got it working, and he goes, wow, you really knew what you're doing on that. <laughs> and I said, well, didn't Joy tell you that, you know, my daughter tell you that this is what I built? Right. And he was, no, I didn't know. And so this coincidence that they were using it. And it was kind of delightful because, I mean, if I'd engineered the whole thing, then, you know, you'd kind of expect it. But when it's just happening organically, it was, it was kind of cool. And he never even knew that I was involved in it. So. Very nice. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we're running almost out of time here. So uh, I'll um, give one... Um, thank yeah. you, thank you. We're getting a, uh, a, a move off the, the, the screen here. But if you have any more questions um, uh, for Jonathan, he's going to be around uh, for another, at least another hour or so. Um, so make sure that you run into him and uh, ask how he can get Worldwide Telescope into your school or uh, into your research lab. So worldwidetelescope.org, it's absolutely free. And um, if you need to contact me, just use the help uh, contact support and... Uh, I'll get into my email box. Sounds great. Please join me in thanking Jonathan for his, uh, joining us here today.